Paul Slozik was born in Southbridge, Massachusetts, and he lives in um, the nearby metropolis of Worcester now. He's been co-founder of many events in community, uh, including the long-running Poets Parlor Poetry Series. He's been a board member of the Worcester County Poetry Association. He has been involved in projects such as Poets in the Gallery, including the Worcester Art Museum, and um, Interface with uh, Art and Artists and Poetry, The Tale of Two Cities uh, in Worcester, where there were um, Worcester poets from Worcester, England, were paired with poets from Worcester, Massachusetts. He's taught poetry workshops at the Worcester Art Museum and the Museum of Fine Arts and the Peabody Essex Museum as well. And he has uh, given tributes to different authors uh, over time uh, also. Um, he's been published in a number of uh, poetry journals and magazines, and he runs a, a poetry blog called Paul's Poetry Playground. And he uh, writes about different aspects of poetry and introduces new and obscure forms of poetry, which I have heard from some of his friends he's famous for, uh, uh, including the ziggurat, the street bitina, the hajanel. And we have Ronald Whittle, Ron Whittle, uh, also born in Worcester, Massachusetts, and educated in Shrewsbury, his hometown. And, and Ron uh, indicates his further education came by way of the U.S. Navy, Vietnam, Apollo 13 recovery team, and 45 years of family living. And Ron uh, indicates in his uh, writing uh, about poetry, he was writing poetry about the war and its effects in Vietnam, and uh, since then he has just been taking off writing and has about 15 compiled books of poetry ready to go. Uh, he is a member of the Worcester County Poetry Association and works in progress outlaw stage at Worcester Artist Group. And he has been a member of the Worcester Art Walk and Canal Walk and the Warrior Writers of Boston. He started a writing group uh, at Veterans Inc. in Worcester. And what he said about his work there is, I've always wanted to give and encouraging and teaching veterans how to share the war experiences through poetry and prose. And I've met some amazing veterans whom, many whom have suggested post-war, have uh, dealt with post-war PTSD or addiction, and found he has found the amazing poems they have within. And his first book of poetry is Postcards from a War Zone, published in 2018. And Susan Roney O'Brien, the poet, said about his book, I was blown away. <laughs> and with that, I would like to ask you to please welcome together that we have Paul and Ron to share their poetry with you. Please give them a hand. All right, so I guess I'll, I'll be the one here kicking this off. Um, uh, I, somewhere along the line, I, I picked up my father's sense of humor. He was born in the Midwest, and, and uh, um, as, a, as a kid, I didn't appreciate his humor until much later in life. So I'm going to start off by telling you a story here that, that he told one, at one point in time. First off, I'd like to know, does anybody out there own a pet dog? I, I can't see, but does anybody? Raise your hands, yeah? Okay, well, I, uh, I own a golden retriever. He's getting pretty old now, but he's one smart dog. Uh, just to give you an idea how smart he is, I, I taught him how to smile as a pup, and he, <laughs> he learned how to spell when he was young as well, and I, and I can prove it. The dog loves popcorn, um, and um, so, you know, I'm kind of a popcorn freak myself. While watching television with my wife, I'd often have to ask her if she wanted a bowl of popcorn, and the dog would race me out to the kitchen. And as time, <laughs> time went on, uh, he would whine about it until I made a bowl. And it reached a point where I would have to spell it out for my wife, you know, P-O-P-C-O-R-N. <laughs> and it didn't take long before the dog learned what I was spelling. <laughs> and he'd beat me out there and sit, and sit there all content with his tail wagging, smiling away. And he figured out, yeah, he figured it all, all out anyway. And so um, I had to make a bowl of popcorn for him as well as uh, my wife and I. So there's many things that he also learned how to do, some good, some bad. Uh, for the past week or so, though, I've had a kind of a serious problem with one of my neighbors. 
he started chasing people on a bike. <laughs> it got so bad that this morning I, I finally had to take his bike away. <laughs> So my father uh, uh, dabbled in, in writing as well. He uh, uh, decided that he was going to write some uh, nursery rhymes. So I'm, I'm just going to read. A, I'm actually in the process of publishing his book this this um, uh, this month. is supposed to be out, but um, he's, my father's been dead for ten years now, and, and and he never published it. And I decided that I would I would do that. But like I said, he had, had a pretty good sense of humor. So the nursery rhyme, the first one that goes. Uh, I woke up this morning to a little bird's song, a pretty tune, but the words were all wrong. <laughs> and the next one would be two, two little birds up in their nest, one chirping, the other took a rest. Mama was out looking for some food. Daddy bird would have helped, but he wasn't in the mood. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna read some, some poetry now from my, uh, my time in the, in the uh, in Vietnam, um, and, the, and the first one I'm going to read is uh, called Cassidy's Sidekick. <clears throat> and many of you may remember the, you know, the, the, who I'm talking about here, which was uh, Hopalong Cassidy. The range was no further than what I could see from our third floor apartment windows in the city. I, w I was Hopalong Cassidy's sidekick, and we had many adventures together. I would lay on the green and purple multicolored linoleum living room floor intently watching Hoppy on the family 10-inch black and white television screen that would get fuzzy and roll from time to time. We were the fastest draw and the fist fightingest duo ever to try to tame the West. Our, our two six-guns holstered to our waist, cowboy boots, black hat was our trademark, and many nights Mom would have to pry the two six-guns from my hands before bedtime and tucking me in. Oh, I, I was going to grow up to be another Hopalong Cassidy, all right, and I knew that for sure. Though I didn't own one yet, my horse was going to be named Blackie. Somewhere over the course of time, I found out that the real world was not black and white and extended way beyond my vision to some kind of a living color that I didn't always agree with nor fit in with. I never forgot my hero, even though as I got older, I thought of him less and less, and I've got to admit, sometimes... Sometimes, while on a mission in my helicopter in the skies over Vietnam, when I was called on to use my military-issue pistol to save my life, and as soon as I pulled it out of the holster and, and pulled the trigger, I could see in my mind the kid that was me laying on the cold linoleum floor in an old three-decker, daydreaming about fighting the bad guys, and here tonight, wondering where Mom was when I really needed her to tuck me in and kiss me goodnight. Because of what I did over in Vietnam, uh, it was, uh, I was a crew chief in a helicopter. And what we did was what they called high-risk rescue, or sometimes they would call it dust-off missions. We were told not to use our real names, or the squadron names, or the helicopter names. There was nothing in this godforsaken land that had my name attached to it. I was given the alias name of Stormy and my helicopter's name was, I named, was misunderstood. <laughs> and the squadron was called the Hounds of Hell or sometimes the Mutts from Marble Mountain. All this was to keep the NVA from putting, our, uh, putting a bounty on our heads. We never turned down a mission of rescue for any reason. A lot of our, our flight time was at night without the aid of night vision like they have today. We were one of two helicopter squadrons that flew at night. We generally had to fight our way in and out and we knew the Marines uh, were going, uh, we were going in for knew that we were the last resort in most cases. And there was not, nothing, nothing quite so fearsome as seeing your helicopter the morning after riddled with bullet holes all around where you had been standing with your machine gun the night before. The title of the poem here is All This Razzmatazz and a Little Hoochie Coochie Besides. Lightning became a business of mine. That's what my business card said anyway. They nicknamed me Stormy, and I used that, na and I, I used that name that someone gave me, and I cast down thunder upon them and upon the land, lighting up the night sky with the raining red death. This valley is mine, and I'm not going to give it up to no one. You ask for the storm? Well, here I am.
stepping away from Vietnam, uh, I'm going to read the next poem. So I'm the worst, I've got to, to admit it. And I dog ear pages or use stray pieces of paper to, to mark my place just to, so I can find it later. Even worse, I write notes in the margins. It's awful what I do. No respect for books. I do, however, respect the authors. I write in the book's margins for later reference and recall, sort of a filing system of thought, which would mean that the author has done his job in getting me to think. I don't always agree with what they write. I don't have to. I don't like it when the message gets lost in a description or when the words are just thrown at a page and hope that they stick. I really hate it when academia makes an attempt to dictate the style of writing for all, all to follow. I really do prefer to be my own person and write in my own style, whatever that may be. Academia has taken it for granted that they know better and are by far, far wiser. That was the title of the poem. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is the book. I mean, this is the poem. I wrote the book. I'll do with it what I want. Yeah. <laughs> um, this one's called to the forecaster. The trouble with forecasts are they're just, they're just forecasts or of something that may may not happen, but might possibly develop into something sometime. Yeah. It's a best guess by professional weather guessers who stick their neck out every night at 11 o'clock on a net, local nightly news. There are many of us whose livelihood depend on someone like that and by himself on an uneasy stage that he, that he walks in, in a, an unforgiving road. I mean, yesterday, I shoveled 14 and a half inches of partly cloudy off my driveway. <laughs> <laughs> so I, w I wish I could go back there again as the title of the next one. When I was a young boy on vacation with my parents, we went to the beach, uh, beach boardwalk once early in the evening. I remember holding my father's hand so not as to get lo not get lost in the throngs of people playing and milling about the boardwalk. Dad bought me some saltwater taffy and a candied apple. I rode the carousel, hobby horses with, and Ferris wheel with my mom. And Dad and I tried our hand at dodging cars. I'm sure he let me win, but I laughed anyway when he acted like he was mortally wounded when I smashed into his car. <laughs> car. The smells of the midway were almost overbearing and filled my childhood senses and the sweetness that hung in the air. The sidewalk barkers could not entice Dad, but he would have no part of it. But we did play the penny arcade games, and Dad shot the guns. We won so much useless plastic junk, it was a treasure to a young boy. I was so proud of Dad. I wished I had known you then. I could have shared my booty. We could have run off with all my riches to some faraway exotic land and lived happily ever after, just you and I, and the plastic pearls I would have put around your neck. Oh, you up. Um, really, I think he's have. You got time for one? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well. <clears throat> this one's called, uh, and to love me is, is even worse. <laughs> why is it people who try the hardest to do the right thing always appear to be mad? And why is it that I am the thesis of thought and pain and equally mad? Shattered within the broken glass of the closed windows of my dreams, I... I see things in reflections as they should have been, but it's much too late now because love doesn't love anybody and doesn't care who it hurts. And there within the ruins and shards of broken glass lays a broken heart on a printed bloodied sheet of paper that reads, be sure to read all instructions before attempting to fall in love with this device. <laughs> you want to take it now? Sure. Um, thank you, Ron. I um, really want to thank Cheryl for this honor um, reading here and the interesting thing is I actually was a feature here about 11 years ago and I have here a very precious artifact to me this <laughs> is the DVD of that program wake up and smell the poetry May 17 2008 and it was sort of embarrassing I was sort of watching it and I spent most of my time doing magic tricks because I was sort of interested in uh, combining poetry and magic. But uh, the interesting thing is the month before I came here and read for the very first time in the open reading. And um, so that would be 
exactly 11 years ago from today. And um, the poem that I read uh, was called The Farmer's Son, and I hope it's not too soon, but I'd like to read it again. <laughs> this is called The Farmer's Son. On a certain June evening, unable to stand in the shadowy depths of sleep, I find myself back in the back of a pickup truck. Seven years old and pining away for Saturday morning cartoons I'll be missing. My mom's at the wheel, steering the old Ford down the rock-infested path to the potato field. My two sisters are already there so eager to begin, they are digging with their bare hands. The soil accumulating in black, quarter moons at the tips of their nails. And my dad, he's perched high in the seat of the John Deere, staring straight ahead as steel fingers rake the earth behind him. It's our job to walk these trenches, trying to tell the dirt-encrusted spuds from stones, dropping our bounty into burlap feed bags Flung over our shoulders. I do not care to be here, laboring under the morning sun. I do not care for potatoes, except for their names. Kennebec, Catawba, Green Mountain, names too exotic, too divine for such bland-tasting fleshy tubers. I believe they are really the names of foreign kingdoms, lands of untold wonders. I am the farmer's son, but not a good one. I am by nature an indoor child grown pasty by the blue light of the television screen. A pale boy who prefers schoolwork to farm work, who withers and faints while picking string beans in the summer heat. My dad conceals his disappointment in the sun who does not share his love for the land he has toiled for his entire lifetime. Yet somehow he understands and tries not to push me so hard. Perhaps he recognizes I am not a crop to be cultivated, but more like a weed which must spread its roots wherever it pleases to survive. And now, once again, it's 30 years in the future. The path I chose led not to the potato field, but to this cramped city apartment where I lie in an unmade bed, trying to come to grips with the passing of my father, harvesting longings and regrets. It is soul, not soil, I dig through now and what I uncover may not be as comforting as potatoes. And um, maybe a little, go a little up from there. Uh, I do a lot of poetry and I do a lot of readings and I have a lot of friends who aren't poets and don't understand it. <laughs> and they want to know, hey, why do you do such a thing? So I wrote this poem to sort of describe what the experience is like reading in front of everyone and sharing their poetry. This is called Poet or Stripper. <laughs> <laughs> if I ever have a 17-year-old daughter, I admit the possibility of becoming quite remote. And one morning, as we're chowing down together on Pop-Tarts and Coca-Cola, she tells me she can't decide on a career? Wavering between poet and stripper, I would have to advise her to choose the latter. <laughs> now, not even <sighs> considering economics, and I heard a good stripper can pull down a couple thousand a week, but as a poet, she'd be lucky to see half of that in her lifetime. <laughs> Stripping is obviously the much more moral, much less degrading profession. <laughs> All you have to expose is skin. And the audiences are always so enthusiastic and responsive, filled with respected members of the community, like businessmen and politicians. <laughs> but as a poet, you got to perform in run sleazy run-down dives, reeking of amaretto and hazelnut. 
and cater the whims of all those underground, on the fringe, alternative lifestyle types. You know who I mean. Environmentalists, liberal thinkers and the like. And they are so usually so indifferent to the poor slob on stage, you practically have to beg them on hands and knees for them to listen, to pay any attention at all. And if they do, they are never satisfied. They keep demanding, take it off, take it all off. The pretenses, the false facades, the masks you wear in public. And you oblige, teasingly peeling away all the layers one by one until your soul is laid bare, your essence revealed, and you're left standing there with your psyche hanging out for a room full of strangers to gawk at. Well, if you ask me, you have to be an intention craving fool with no self-respect to want to do such a humiliating thing like that. <laughs> Thank you. As um, Cheryl mentioned, um, I have this sort of obsession with poetry forms, really obscure ones, uh, like the Minute Poem, the ABC Darien, but it goes even beyond that because I start <laughs> creating my own. <coughs> And so um, I'm just going to do some uh, form poems. Um, the one I'm sort of really proud of is one called The Street Bettina. And it was written in honor of a venue for, that was run many years by a mutual friend of ours, Anne Marie Lucci, called The Street Beat. And so for the fifth anniversary, I wrote this poetry form to commemorate The Street Beat. And it's an interesting form um, because it's um, eight lines. Each, each line is only eight syllables apiece. But what makes it unique and sort of uh, challenging is the first syllable of the first line becomes the second syllable in the second line, and then the third on and on until the eighth syllable is. And so it actually creates a sort of a natural rhythm and beat. So I'm going to go with, I'm just going to read you two short ones. Um, this one is called Travel Advisory. Go unprepared into the world for go certainty pretend to be cargo bound for distant ports perhaps the go be desert mars travel by pogo stick or dreams a blank map your logo treat the unknown as your amigo or ignore this advice but go go <laughs> oh, thank you. And this one is called um, Ghost Story. Local legends say if you go solo into the deep, dark woods when the lotus blossom first bloom and the moon's low in the night sky, the girl in yellow will appear, her lips mouthing, hello, my love while lunar light spills like lotion on skin translucent as jello. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, one of my favorite local poets is a poet named John Hodgen. I'm not sure if he had read here, but he is the most amazing poet, and he is a mentor for so many people. And I came across a poem that he wrote Go forget me now, and it's about his brother passing away. And I noticed he did something really unusual, especially for a serious poet. His poem used a monorhyme, and that means that every word rhymed together. And usually that's a comic effect, but it was just heartbreaking to read that. So I decided that poem as inspiration, I created a form called the Hodgenel. <laughs> And for a while, I didn't tell him about it because I was afraid that I was going to get a cease and resist letter from him. Um, but I told him, and he was, so, it was, he was so nice, and he said that it meant a lot, especially that poem, which meant so much for him and inspired me to create this form. Um, so um, the way this works is a 21-line poem. It has a monorhyme. Every word, every end, the end rhyme all rhymes together. So the, the, it would be a a a a a a a a and um, the first line is repeated as the seventh line, the 14th line, and the 21st line. <laughs> and so this poem is called, I'm Not Santa. 
It doesn't mean I'm Santa just because I wear a white beard. It seems I can't even walk down the street without being jeered with ho ho hoes by nasty little brats, their faces smeared with jam. Adults even worse, drunk, voices slurred, all teared up, whining that I never brought them a certain doll or multi-gear director set. What would they do if I turned to them and sneered? It doesn't mean I'm Santa just because I wear a white beard. And don't try to climb upon my lap. That would just be weird. My facial hair is real. I'm no mall Santa with fake whiskers adhered to my cheeks with spirit gum. It might be easier if I sheared the whole thing off, but I won't. I have persevered, endured stupid jokes about reindeer and elves, silently steered past taunting teens. St. Nick's a figure not to be mocked, but feared. It doesn't mean I'm Santa just because I wear a white beard. Yet all my tormentors one day might fi find themselves speared with sprigs of holly through their hearts or basted and seared over an open flame like a Christmas goose, or simply disappeared down a chimney. So now that we have this matter all cleared up, please don't Santa me any more. I'd much rather be King Leard, or from all you poets, Walt Whitman or John Greenleaf Witty Eared. <laughs> it doesn't mean I'm Santa just because I wear a white beard. <laughs> I don't like goodbyes. I never have. They always make us feel like I'll never see you again in this lifetime. I made that mistake once with someone I love very much, and I won't ever do that again. I say things like, see you soon, or take care, my friend. Goodbye just seems so final, and, and, and see you soon seems to imply... Sometime in the near future, there'll be another meeting. Who knows when or where or if we get to live that long. So don't take offense if I don't say goodbye, for I mean that in a positive way. When I say see you soon, it means I think enough about you that I don't want to say goodbye. It's just too hard for me to leave you. So see you soon. Take care. God bless. <laughs> Have a great rest of the day. Thank you.